Hello, I'm Thomas Baker, a pediatric neuropsychologist from the University of Duke, and I'm here today to talk about the education system in the United States. Now, you all know how important the education system is to ensuring that our future generations are equipped to solve problems, and you also are all probably familiar with the fact that the United States education system is falling behind other countries like Finland and South Korea and even Singapore. Okay, so why should you care? Well, what if I told you that the education systems in Finland are based on American research? In fact, Palsy Solberg, a Finnish educator and educational theorist, has even stated in an interview to Huffington Post that much of the education system in Finland is based purely on American research. And as you can see by this graph, the cost per student in the United States has gone up dramatically since 1970, but our test scores are stagnant. In order for the United States to remain an economic leader and a captain of industry, we need to improve our education system. And so I'm going to show you some ways that science and research has concluded could help us have much stronger students and also students that live happier lives and are much more content with their lives. The first thing we can do to improve our education system is to reduce stress. Now, there's two ways. One is that research from 1995 and 2004 has shown that when students are perceived to be in a hostile environment or an unsafe environment, parts of their brain shut down and they can no longer memorize or learn. And now the second way that we can improve learning and reduce stress is a more holistic approach. As you can see by this curve, students need some stress in order to encourage them and to keep them captivated by the information they're learning but too much stress results in them feeling overwhelmed, fatigued, and burned out, and it destroys all passion and motivation to learn, and they'll be less receptive to learning, and they won't be enthusiastic and enjoy it. So we need to make sure that we're not giving them so much work that they feel drowned. They need to be able to be creative and to enjoy what they're learning and find passion in it, not view it as a routine. A second approach to improving the way we teach our students in the United States is to start bilingual learning from an early age, a, a full approach, not just a couple classes required in high school. Studies from 1992 and 2001 show that in order for a student to really grasp and learn a second language, it needs to be started at a very young age. And a second study in 2008 showed that when you take low socioeconomic students and high socioeconomic students, and you put the lowest socioeconomic students in a bilingual program from an early age, that they will outscore and outcompete the people from the higher socioeconomic status that were not placed in a bilingual program. And so there's a huge correlation between learning a second language at a younger age and higher performance and higher creative learning. The next way I think we can better prepare students is by incorporating music and arts into their education. A 2009 Vanderbilt study showed that when measuring the brains of non-musicians and musicians using near-infrared spectrography, that the brains of the musicians had more frontal lobe bilateral communication, which can be equated to more creativity and better memory. In fact, creativity, as we go into the 21st century, will become one of the most valuable traits as AI and robotics continue to take more complicated and complex jobs away from people. It's pretty well known that there's a direct correlation between the amount of exercise a student gets and their academic performance. Uh, the couple studies listed here, and one of them, they had two groups. One had three minutes of aerobic exercise before performing a task, and the other didn't. And the one with the exercise performed much better. And in the later 2008 study, it was shown that there was a direct correlation between memory and ability to complete a task and the amount of exercise that student got in a week. Now, if you look at this graph taken from a book written in 2013 about educating the student body, it shows that between the two test groups of those that didn't exercise and those that did, the ones that did exercise scored much higher on their assignments. And even in Finland, as you can see by the infographic, they reduced homework and increased the amount of free time and physical activity time they have during schools. And as we already know, students in Finland usually perform much, much better than American students. Lastly, I would like to outline three teaching strategies. The first one is that there's a difference between memorization and learning. And now, that's quite obvious. I'm sure you've all heard it before. But let's think about it. The way the brain works is it has many synapses. And whenever it's learning new information, it has to make connections between the synapses. And so, if teachers can take abstract ideas and 
put them in a way that's more relatable to the students or so the students can see a practical application for them, the students will better be able to understand the material and not just memorize it. So teachers developing more of a personal relationship and getting to know the students allows them to find ways to relate sort of abstract information to that student's life and that allows those synapses to make better connections so the student really understands the material instead of just memorizing it for a test. Another method for improving learning would be implementing memory exercises. And so a 2011 study took students who were struggling with particular math problems and gave some of them memory exercises and gave the others just more math problems. And so the students that had the memory exercises ended up doing better on the math problems than those who just repeated doing math problems because the problem didn't lie with the student's ability to understand the mathematical concepts. It had to do with the students not having their memory trained to retain the information long enough to do an equation. My final suggestion would be implementing attention training exercises at a young age. And a 2012 study showed that when taking worse performing students and better performing students and giving the worst performance students attention training at a young age, they were able to catch up to the higher students later on. And it concluded that one of the most cost effective ways to help improve students' abilities to learn is to implement attention training programs at a young age. And this is especially important as we get to a new generation who grew up on technology where information is fast paced and they may not have the long attention spans of previous generations. So in conclusion, what do all these studies really mean? Well, what they really mean is that if we want our students to be more successful, we need to let them be kids. It seems simple, but it's not. Our current education system is cutthroat competitive, is tons of busy work, involves students sitting in a classroom all day. But we need to follow the normal biology of the brain. Students need to be sleeping, they need to be eating, they need to be exercising, they need to be allowed to pursue things that interest them and to explore. And when we take these things away and essentially turn kids into office workers, we're going to see our academics decrease, but our spending increase. If we would just simplify school and let kids be kids, we would see a dramatic increase in their performance, but also in their mental health. And we have a lot of mental health issues going on nowadays. And so that's all I really have to say. 